Good morning, uh, still. Again, my name is Amy Herr from Bioengineering here at UC Berkeley, and we're gonna switch gears a little bit now. So we've had some great uh, presentations, obviously, and also I think some uh, start of some vigorous discussion, even maybe some disagreements or different opinions in the, even the first two speakers that we've had, so that's absolutely fantastic. Um, it is my pleasure to moderate this panel. So the way the panel is going to run, and hopefully this is similar to what we've discussed before, is I'm gonna give a very, very short introduction to the organization organizations that the panelists are from. Um, I will then allow each panelist roughly five minutes, if you could, to tell a little bit about yourself and also fill in the gaps that, that I have that you think are important in terms of the organizations that you're from. After that, we are going to move right into discussion uh, with the audience. And the, the bulk of the time that we have together will focus on that. Of course, it is important to note that right after the panel discussion is lunch, right? That's at 1.15. Uh, so we're going to keep an eye on the time for sure. And that's why we've chosen not to take a little um, impromptu break right now. So I'm gonna just introduce each of the little uh, blurbs that I have here for the organizations and then I'll hand it over to you um, for, the, for the majority of the discussion. Um, so we do um, have Filiberto Decal. If when I say your name, if you could raise your hand also, that would be great, fantastic, from Novartis. So Novartis's um, mission um, is to discover, develop, and successfully market innovative products to prevent and cure diseases, to ease suffering, and to enhance the quality of life. They have work in the areas of pharmaceuticals, vaccines, and diagnostics. For perspective, Novartis employs nearly 100,000 staff and has sales of over 44 billion in 2009. Uh, the last numbers that I could find, the most recent numbers that I could find. I also wanted to mention that Novartis spends about seven and a half billion dollars a year on R&D programs. Another important point I wanted to make about Novartis was that Novartis has a Novartis Vaccines Institute for Global Health that's been established in 2007. And the focus of that institute is on diseases that are not receiving adequate attention, especially diseases that are particularly de devastating to developing countries. It's a little bit of background on Novartis, a very short background of Novartis. We're also uh, honored to have with us today Peter Daly from Cepheid. Uh, fantastic. So Cepheid is an on-demand molecular diagnostics company that develops, manufactures, and markets fully integrated systems and tests for genetic analysis in the clinical, industrial, and biothreat markets. Cepheid is focusing on applications where rapid molecular testing are particularly important. And some of those examples include identifying infectious diseases and cancer in the clinical market, also, application areas include food, agricultural, and environmental testing in the industrial market, and identifying bioterrorism agents in the biothreats market. So a very brief introduction to Cepheid there, and we'll have more information. It is also our pleasure to have Stuart Coulson from DREV, um, switching gears a little bit to get a wide perspective. Um, DREV is a nonprofit design firm and technology incubator that develops market-driven products to improve the health and outcomes of people living on less than $2 a day. So the mission is essentially <laughs> to start a design revolution in the way products are designed, marketed, and distributed. The uh, DREV enables new sources of, in I'm sorry, the, um, one of the goals is to enable new sources of income and improved health care for people who represent the other 90% of the world. So understanding local conditions, needs, and economic realities of customers is critical to the success and sustainability of any project promoting development in less industrialized economies. And we'll hear more about that as well. We also have Andy Robertson from BioVentures for Global Health. BioVentures, or um, BVGH for short, is also a nonprofit organization whose mission is to save lives by accelerating the development of novel biotechnology-based drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics to address the unmet medical needs of the developing world. BVGH was founded in 2004 with startup grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the support of the Biotechnology Industry Association, or BIO, um, hence the BioVentures for Global Health. Um, and lastly, but not least, we're also honored to have Eric Douglas from CellScope with us today. CellScope brings medical microscopy to the mobile phone platform. Uh, this uh, organization was founded out of work that was done in our very own Professor Dan Fletcher's lab here in bioengineering at UC Berkeley. Um, CellScope works to increase access to health data from portable low-cost microscope attachments to cell phones coupled with wireless connection to professional knowledge. And CellScope believes that these types of technologies can play a pivotal role in improving health monitoring and disease diagnosis. 
So with that, I hope that gives you a little bit of background um, on the organizations that are represented. I'm going to move to each of you to make maybe roughly five minutes of opening comments. And I'm going to hold you to that if I can. Um, and I think we have a perfect, right there, a timer. So if you could pay attention to that, that would help me a lot as well. Um, there are two panelists here who wanted to show a couple of slides. So we will hold those to last, actually, and go first with the first three panelists um, who do not have slides for your opening remarks. So um, maybe we could start with, um, so those two, Stuart Colson, if you don't mind. Do you want to come up there or sit? Uh, if you're more comfortable here, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, I'll bring my stuff, though. Hi, so as Amy mentioned, I'm a non-exec director at DREV. Uh, we're based in Palo Alto, uh, where we design products for the other 90%, and we focus mostly on uh, healthcare and improving health, and also uh, eradicating poverty, mostly through healthcare devices. And instead of slides, I brought along some uh, products that we're developing, and I'll show those to you in a minute. Another role that I have is that I'm a lecturer at a university on the other side of the bay with a really good football team. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta say it. And, uh, and I teach in the D school, I teach entrepreneurial design for extreme affordability, a class where we take postgrads and postdocs. We teach them design thinking as a methodology. We ship them out to various countries around the world. They pick up projects from NGOs that we've already set up a relationship with bring them back and then work on developing a prototype and a business plan to implement the project. Some of those become spin-outs, some of them become transfers to the NGO, and we've had quite a lot of success over the years. And the reason why I mention that is that both DREV and Extreme Affordability use this same methodology, this uh, design thinking methodology, in order to try and address these problems. What we do is we start from the ground up. So I'm not a technologist. I'm not going to talk about microfluidics or anything like it. I'm a business person. We start by looking at the end user. We gain empathy with the end user. We go in field. We live in their houses. We work in their clinics. We wear their shoes for long periods of time and try and figure out what we could do to apply some technology that we can discover, because we're based in Palo Alto and we can ask anybody in the Bay Area to help us to those particular problems with the minimum impact and the minimum need for retraining or, or, um, or changing their lifestyle or changing what they do in any way. And obviously we focus primarily on things like cost but also on ruggedization and low maintenance and finding distribution networks which is one of the hardest things in the developing world to do, understanding the actual economics, who's going to pay for it, who's going to actually value it and buy it. Uh, how do you supply consumables, or how do you go back and do maintenance, all these kind of things. So those are the areas that we, uh, that we work on. So I brought a couple of products to show you, just to see where we're going. This is uh, DREV's Comet product. As you can see, it looks like a light bulb over here, but inside here it's got a number of blue LEDs. And this is for use in rural clinics in India to treat bilirubin or jaundice in premature and neonatal babies. Um, we have a three, uh, three products in this range. One is called Brilliance. Brilliance is actually a replacement for a regular, if you like, hospital-based blue light treatment for this jaundice. Um, we have it down at the moment to about $135 delivered to the hospital, including a wheeled full steel stand to hold it at the right uh, distance from the baby. Uh, Comet is designed to go into more rural locations where perhaps all they have is a light bulb fixture. And so this will replace either a blue light bulb that blows out really quickly. This has about a 50,000 hour uh, mean time between failure. Or it'll, or it'll replace the wrong bulb that is often put in place when the right bulb blows. And the local clinician will just put in whatever bulb they find and think that that will work. Um, the second product I have, this is still in development. This is Global Scope. So this is a fully fledged microscope. Uh, it will work in a bright field illumination environment for about $250 delivered to the field. It will work in an epifluorescent environment for about $450. And so it's a fully functional, uh, usable clinical microscope. Somebody earlier was talking about origami, so I brought some origami. 
I'm not going to try and put it together right here on the stage, but I'll put it together while I'm sitting down there. This is, a, this is a very simple device. This is from Extreme Affordability. So this is a project that was run about two years ago working with hospitals in Mexico. And this is a device when you fold it up, and I'll show it to you as, we, as other people talk, uh, for uh, providing the um, asthma treatment for children. So it allows them to spray their uh, steroids in one end and breathe out the other end. This replaces practices such as locking children in small cabinets and spraying their dosage into the cabinet and having them uh, breathe the air. And that sells for about four cents. And obviously comes flat packed. So. <laughs> this is uh, probably one of the more famous extreme affordability products. This is Embrace, the baby incubator. Um, this is out of the course about three years ago. This product is now um, fully functional and going under clinical tests in India. And uh, it has a phase change chemical in the back, keeps the baby warm for about four hours. The phase change chemical can be heated by hot water, so you can stick it in a three, three brick stove and just heat it up, and uh, sells for about $26. I should also mention, just very quickly, the, um, the uh, baby jaundice treatment device. The reason why I'm speaking here and not the executive director of DREV, Chris Johnson, is she's currently in India signing the final agreement for the manufacturing of our Brilliance product with an Indian manufacturer who's also going to distribute. Thank you. Okay, Eric, can we go with you next? Excellent. Hi uh, everybody, I'm Eric Douglas uh, from Cellscope and I've got a demo too. This is our, uh, one of our prototypes we're working with now that, as, as Amy was saying, basically what we're trying to do is uh, bring um, microscopy, this important technique that we all know and love, to uh, a variety of low resource settings using the, the power and reach of the mobile phone platform. So in this case we have a prototype that is based on a, a smartphone that many of you might have um, with uh, you know, con some conventional optics in here, a, uh, a mirrors to, to have a, a bent optical path and then a stage holder, which can be illuminated either using ambient light, um, LEDs. We're also doing fluorescence to be able to do uh, more specific diagnostic detection of a lot of things, including TB and malaria. And most of our testing so far has been on um, TB and malaria. And uh, we've, we've been um, rolling out devices for testing in, in Uganda with some collaborators from UCSF and also um, in India as a test with a, a group called uh, World Health Partners that's based here in Berkeley, but their operations are based in India. And uh, kind of going beyond just testing the functionality of the device in our lab, but trying to see that it actually works you know, in, in their telemedicine operation as operated by uh, these um, local clinic operators that, that have very limited training. They're, basically, the, the link they have now is a, is a webcam to a doctor in Delhi um, who can, you know, Take some, take some vital signs, uh, do, do a few very basic um, tests, but doesn't have any real diagnostic capacity besides just looking at the person. So we're trying to give them um, microscopes and give them that, that link between the remote village clinic and, uh, and the, the doctor with expertise in Delhi. So um, my, my own background, I, I uh, did my PhD here at Berkeley with Rich Matthews doing the old-fashioned uh, microfluidics with the expensive glass and, and silicon and uh, pumps and valves and all that stuff. And, and there, there, there's a lot of great work still to be done in that field, but uh, it, it's been really exciting. Um, I moved over to do a postdoc with Dan Fletcher to, to, to do the sort of work that, that um, you know, does, does address a much lower resource setting and a, much, you know, a, a very immediate need where, where we can see a lot of tangible um, benefit to, to what we're, we're trying to make. So the goal of Cellscope Incorporated, the, the company that I'm one of the co-founders, uh, is to try and commercialize these technologies. Um, we're, we're still working closely with, with Dan Fletcher and the group to be able to continue to develop the technology. But uh, you know, the, the initial technology we've developed has been for these developing world applications. But now, a, a, as a company, some of the stuff we're trying to focus on is also for the low resource setting of the home um, in the US. So trying to make some, some devices that will be used for uh, lower magnification patient monitoring. For example, we've got a, a cell phone otoscope to be able to do, um, you know, uh, ear infection is the most common, is the, is, is the most common pediatric uh, complaint besides the common cold. And, you know, anyone with children, 
knows that you know, they wake up at 2 a.m., the child's screaming, they don't know what's going on, so they have to take him to the emergency room. Uh, what we're trying to do is to, to direct the, the parent and the child to an appropriate level of care from home in real time so that it'll save them a trip and also take some costs out of the, the healthcare system. So we've kind of gone back and forth where we, we, we've developed this technology in our lab. We've been you know, working in collaboration with people in the developing world to make it a functional technology, an appropriate technology that'll work there. But now we're starting to bring some of that back to, the, to, to US applications and um, having so far a, a, a good response to that. So that's what we're up to, thanks. Andy. So switching from a commercial perspective back to the nonprofit, Andy Robertson. And thanks for this. And, uh, so yeah, my name is Andy Robertson. I'm at the I'm the chief policy officer and senior director at BioVentures for Global Health. So BBGH is a, a nonprofit organization. Most of our funding comes from the Gates Foundation, but we do have other contributors as well. Um, as Amy uh, said, our, our main goal is really to see if we can engage the private sector to become more involved in global health uh, issues and challenges. I mean, um, we, we think this is definitely, a, a, as everybody I think in this room would acknowledge, this is definitely a huge um, uh, issue, um, global health disparities. But one thing that we're looking to do is we think that that solution really requires um, investment and engagement from the private sector. So how do we do this? I think there's really three ways that um, we, we look to engage this and, and, and uh, seek this goal. Um, the first is to actually lower the cost, that it, it, um, the cost burden of research and development in, in global health. I mean, it's quite an expensive venture. Um, you know, the drug development could be up to $1.2 uh, billion. Um, diagnostics less so, but still it could be a significant burden for nonprofits. So um, to this end, we look to, to cost-cutting measures, and this includes um, making connections between academic labs and um, private industry, but also um, you know, addressing issues like intellectual property. Uh, we um, administer the, the knowledge pool for open innovation, which GlaxoSmithKline put forward. Um, this is a way to actually, uh, you know, contributors um, actually put intellectual property that can be used um, basically royalty-free for a developing country context, and then uh, we try to engage academic labs to actually use this, engage it, understand how to use it, and then apply it to an actual um, solution to a particular global health challenge. Um, the second thing that we actually do is, in addition to actually reducing costs, is actually to increase the, the rewards of conducting uh, this type of research. I mean, this really comes to um, uh, looking at market-based incentives. I think uh, everybody in this room has probably heard that global health uh, is a, a victim of what's called a market failure, where the social need um, is, uh, greatly outweighs the market demand. And the purchase power in a lot of these countries just isn't, isn't um, adequate. So are there ways to actually improve this? And um, to give you an example of one of the programs that we're actively involved in is the FDA's priority review voucher program. Um, so this PRV program, which actually Novartis uh, has the first uh, and only PRV so far. Um, it, what it is is uh, for any company de um, developing a drug or a vaccine uh, for um, one of 16 neglected tropical diseases gets a voucher. And that voucher, in turn, can use, they can use it for the next drug of their choice, be it for cholesterol-lowering drug, um, erectile dysfunction, whatever, and actually bumps it to the top of the line for FDA review. So they actually get another six to 10 months, um, uh, get to the market that much faster, and it can be worth quite a bit of money, um, depending on, uh, on how it's actually used. So that's an example of what we're looking at in terms of um, raising the, the rewards. Um, a third thing that we actually do is, uh, on top of this, is actually just education. And this kind of gets to, um, we're trying to get past this issue of what was called a bounded rationality, where people only really seriously consider the choices that, um, that they know about. Uh, Bernard, you actually mentioned this. There actually is some money to be made in global health, and we're not looking at this. It, it has the, uh, the aura of being a charitable endeavor, but I think for um, a big part of it, it's something that can be profitable, um, particularly through strategies like market consolidation um, and then using some of these other incentives that, that I mentioned. So can we educate? And, and we do this through um, consulting, through counseling, um, through advising, and, uh, and through actually um, making the connections with um, uh, people that have done this through case studies. Um, Napa Pharmaceuticals is a very good example of one which is actually located in, in the Bay Area, where they've actually looked to um, neglected diseases as um, one of their core profit models. So um, you know, people have brought up uh, products. Our products are, are mostly in, in uh, the form of reports. Um, 
This is one which I brought a few copies of this. I think they might all be gone by now. It's our um, diagnostics innovation map, which I thought was um, relevant here. Uh, my colleague Priya Mehta was instrumental in putting this together. Um, if these are all gone, I highly recommend you guys go to our website at bvgh.org. And um, you can find this report as, uh, along with many others. Um, it really maps out where we are and uh, the diagnostic field. It gives a good survey of that. And I'm also looking forward. It actually um, uh, preludes to one of our uh, core initiatives right now, which is putting together um, a poll-based mechanism, almost like a prize-type um, system, which will help um, share the, uh, the risk to sponsors. Um, that, uh, sorry, um, contrast this with grants or um, contracts, where you just basically pay for effort. And a pool-based incentive, what you do is you pay for success. And so this is a way that um, sponsors can be sure they get the product that they want, and it actually helps mitigate the risk um, between sponsors and developers. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Philibert Lecal. I'm director of uh, global marketing for new products in Novartis Diagnostics. New products means whatever is not currently on the market today. So um, my goal, I guess, is to try to understand what could be brought to market and to fruition for patients, especially in the next 15 to 20 years, which is not a small task. I thought I can present you with just one slide. Uh, it will be only the only the all five minutes of my talk. And this goes back in my previous 20 years of work with diagnostics, I was being confronted with two questions. The first one was, for whatever product we're planning on putting on the market, the first question is, can we make it? And I have absolutely no doubt that there is technology um, knowledge, technological knowledge and willingness to make it happen. If it's not today, it's gonna to be tomorrow. So the answer to the question is yes. Whatever we can possibly do, we will, we will be able to do. The second question is, can we sell it? Will we be able to build something that actually changes patient's life, that actually modifies the way medicine is practiced? And you think that the best medicine is prevention. This uh, is a very tough question that I haven't, found, haven't been able to find the answer yet. So what I, uh, I'm gonna give you today is the house that uh, if we all manage to build in a building good way, will bring products to market that we have the patient, which is and will remain at the core of our efforts now and tomorrow. Every good house has a very solid foundation. Uh, in this case, this house has two foundations. The first one is the biological truth. Let's now go around in a wild goose chase. Let's make sure that the virus causes the disease. Therefore, we, by identifying the virus, we can predict the disease or stop the disease from spreading or from happening. On top of that, there must be clinical utility. If the test doesn't improve patient's health, doesn't speed up the way medicine is practiced, the decision is taken from the, from the surgeon, from the physician, from anybody, that the test will have a very short lifespan. Then two big pillars, health, economics, and reimbursement, because again, we talk about health, but ultimately it's, it's about money. It's about how much it costs to produce, how much it costs to manufacture, how much it costs to sell, distribute, how much is reimbursed. And uh, I'm using these two different, different uh, philosophies. One is reimbursement and one is health economics. Let's talk about health economics for a second. Is the new technology, is the new assay able to diagnose a disease, or prevent a disease that causes some savings in a healthcare system? If yes, there will be organizations, insurances, um, countries willing to pay for that. Even if clinical utility is not dramatically improved, over the previous versions. On the other hand, if health economics is negative, it costs a lot, but clinical utility is huge, then the test, the assay, the instrumental platform will be adopted because even though it requires more money, it will make such a dramatic difference in the way medicine is practiced that people will buy, surgeons will use it, patients will, will pay for that. The reimbursement is kind of a medicine of a medicine. We'll be able to mitigate the effects of high price drugs, high price technologies, or um, expensive platforms. And that again is based on clinical utility and the health economics. On top of that, if we have good foundations, if we have good pillars, and we keep the patient in focus, 
Then last but not least effort is pre-marketing, which is how do we find channels to bring this product asset, this platform to the market, which are the, uh, the key opinion leaders that will influence the adoption, uh, which will be the countries where the product will be sold or will be positioned, how it will be positioned, and how can we make the product known to the public, to the physicians, to the healthcare practitioners, so adoption will, will uh, not, not follow a very, um, a very negative um, takeoff phase, but be more kind of a hockey stick. They will make sure that medicine is changed almost overnight. Thank you. And last but not least. Very good. Okay. Very good. Uh, my name is Pete Daly, and I just realized I work for a nonprofit organization also, which is Cepheid. It's not the idea, if, but, uh, and hopefully that'll change, but I work for a nonprofit organization. So, so since this a uh, lot of emphasis on microfluidics, I felt like titling this slide Microfluidic This. <laughs> because this is the challenge. It's sputum. And actually, Cepheid started out as basically a microfluidic and uh, MEMS company uh, in the late 90s. And I, I, I think uh, it, it isn't now. And, and along the way, it got mugged by specimens. And that's the thing to, to think about is, uh, as, uh, as was said before, you have to think about the, the specimen and the processing of that specimen, but also the number of organisms. And so perfect uh, slide before lunch. We, let's think about this over lunch is what a sputum is. And if you were to turn that upside down, it would look like this slide was turned upside down because a sample like this, a viscous sample, defies gravity, right? There's blood, it uh, it's can be purulent, all things that can inhibit uh, molecular diagnostic uh, uh, tests. And the target organisms uh, might be 100 or 200 organisms in five to 10 mLs of this specimen. Uh, so s samples don't come in five microliter aliquots of purified uh, uh, DNA, and that's something, uh, that's something to consider. And the organisms, like TB, basically has a still belted radial uh, cell wall that you have to break down to uh, get after the nucleic, uh, nucleic acid. Uh, just in, in, we were talking about partnerships before, and uh, you might have seen in the, uh, in the news the WHO announced uh, 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 their uh, approval of the gene expert uh, tuberculosis assay uh, de uh, developed by Cepheid, but it was actually a partnership uh, with the, uh, an academic partner, David Aland, the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, and he actually started working with Cepheid and, and really chose Cepheid uh, uh, earlier uh, in this decade uh, to work with on a TB test. And really, he's been the visionary uh, from the beginning and all the way through in, uh, in working on this assay. And many of you might know that Donica Helb actually was, worked in David's lab and actually is a co-author on several of the early papers and in development to, of this assay. But uh, so Cephi had partnered uh, uh, with David along the way was uh, substantial funding uh, from the Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics. I got the money up there, seven million, 4.2 million. Cepheid would not have done this uh, and developed this assay uh, for use in developing countries uh, without this uh, funding. And this funding actually provided so that the, uh, the assay uh, in, uh, in the uh, cartridge that, um, that we've developed uh, could have all of the components, all of the reagents, uh, in the assay, stable at 45 degrees uh, for 18 months, and then uh, could be uh, uh, fully automated with the result uh, coming out. Uh, we're continuing to work with the uh, FIND, and that's another organization that part we partnered with, the Foundation for Innovative Diagnostics, and they've been uh, described before. Uh, this moves the testing for tuberculosis from a several week proposition to less than, uh, uh, less than two hours. And, uh, and that, of course, led to uh, the, the uh, performance uh, that was in a recent New England Journal of Medicine uh, paper in 1,000 patients uh, with uh, 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 outstanding sensitivity and specificity, both in patients that are smear positive, in other words, high levels of tuberculosis, 
and also in patients that are smear negative. Uh, this was just the first step, the first clinical trial. Uh, actually, it was run by FIND, not by Cepheid. And then in further testing uh, by the WHO, they have a whole process where the assay is then used in multiple environments uh, and evaluated by their strategic and uh, technical advisory group, or STAG. Uh, in, and actually, uh, this has been now uh, tested on uh, over 7,000 patients, and uh, that led to the recent approval. Uh, and again, uh, I've worked with uh, Cepheid for about uh, five years, and I, uh, my uh, 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 graduate degree is from the University of California, Berkeley here, uh, both the School of Public Health and the Microbiology Graduate Group a long time ago. Uh, so I'll be glad to, to talk with you uh, uh, further about this in the discussion. Okay, great. With that, thank you all for those short introductions and for sticking to the time. I'm just going to um, move right into asking for the audience participation. I do want to say a couple of things first. It would be fantastic to get a clinical and public health perspective, as I know that there's several individuals with that background here. Also, I especially want to encourage the students and postdocs who are among us um, to also please uh, either come forth with questions or comments that you may have from your perspective. Um, again, please state your name and affiliation. If it's safe for you to do so, I I know it's a little steep in the back. Also, please stand up. And the reason for our motivation in doing that is I sense discussion will move beyond the borders of this room. And it's nice to let people around you know who you are in case they wanna, they wanna talk to you about your comment or your statement. Um, so our, our microphone people, Augusto, thank you. Anyone else? John, thank you. So we'll just dive right in. If anyone has any comments or questions. Okay, I'll start off, absolutely. <laughs> so Tamina and I um, prepared for this uh, effort in getting started. So I'm, I'm gonna start off with a question for um, Filiberto, uh, if I might, and then obviously anyone else, please jump in if you have comments as well. So one question that Tamina and I had discussed is, do you see diagnostics as a gateway product um, in emerging economies like India that are crippled by health worker shortages and where people rely heavily on self-care? Do you think most of your diagnostics will be over-the-counter products, or do you have another perspective on that? I see diagnostic as, as an enabler rather than anything else. And I, I've heard another uh, terminology that instead of point of care is point of need, and exactly when, when the diagnostic is needed. I completely, um, I'm completely aware of the role diagnostic can play in, in developing countries. I can tell you that there are uh, enormous efforts from all the major diagnostic industries in, in the world to access those markets for two big, big, big reasons. Um, is, is a natural development of the, of the healthcare awareness in those countries as well. There are better routes to, for distribution. There's better awareness. There's more openness to um, manufacturing capabilities as well and more, more know-how and how to manufacture those, those reagents and is, is the next big frontier. If you really want to um, speak about a, a single world, then, then WWW does not necessarily stay, have to stay within the computer, but it has to move and transcend the, the, the national border. So definitely there's a huge uh, potential in developing countries. I believe the next five years we'll see dramatic, dramatic increase in accessibility of healthcare through good diagnosis at reasonable prices in developing countries all over the world. If none of the other panelists have any comments, are there well, any ideas? Just talk briefly about that. Yeah, um, in terms of kind of definition of point of care, I think that's an important area to think about if you're designing or thinking about new products or diagnostic solutions. Um, most of the people that you're trying to serve in the developing world are not actually physically close or time-wise close to point of care. And no matter how you define it, even the, the, the most, um, uh, the worst looking rural clinic is not going to be um, very accessible to most of the people who exhibit illnesses and need to be diagnosed. And so in terms of trying to reach down to that actual individual and you know, deal within the, the community and within the, the village, I think that's probably an important focus that um, some people miss in terms of trying to figure out where their device is going to get used or where their diagnostic is going to get used. And particularly, of course, in terms of diagnostics as opposed to treatment because diagnosis is the first thing that usually will happen. Somebody falls sick and somebody tries to figure out what's wrong with them. 
And so thinking about how your product can actually be used, not even at a point of care, but at a point of diagnosis prior to somebody deciding to go to a point of care is probably one of the big challenges. I think that's even true in the United States. Uh, in terms of molecular or nucleic acid diagnostics, something like 80 to 90% of nucleic acid diagnostics are done in 11 laboratories in the entire United States. Uh, and so that's actually the objective of Cepheid is to move that closer to the patient, uh, closer uh, to the physician. Um, so that when a patient at three o'clock in the morning uh, comes in and is extremely sick and needs a decision in terms of treatment that they can, they can get that done. Uh, Ellen. Oh, hi. Alan Northrup, Microfluidic Systems. Uh, let me go right for the jugular. Uh, uh, um, Bernard mentioned that the biggest impact disease in the world is diabetes in India and China. I, excuse me for being blunt. Isn't it true, um, Filberto, that one of the pillars of the business is, is there a drug? Can I, can I protect my jeweler by saying that I'm responsible for the diagnostic business? Uh, diabetes does not fall in the realm of my responsibility, so whatever answer I'm going to give you is going to be either false or incorrect. Are there other comments, other perspective? Sure. I just appreciated what uh, Bernard had to say this morning. I think as people work on diagnostics, we need to work on our self-esteem. And he really helped me there uh, in that uh, uh, the emphasis is often on pharmaceuticals. And there's tremendous value in diagnostics. And we shouldn't uh, be ashamed of that. I'm not always sure that for diagnostics, the objective uh, needs to be cheap. It needs to be uh, delivering uh, health care and focus on impact on the disease. And I think he did a good job of saying, and I think it's true, uh, that diagnostics impact 60, 70, 80 percent of disease treatment. Sorry, I mean, just, to, just to add to that quickly, and, um, not to play devil's advocate too much, but I mean, it, it, like one thing about this is also not, if you do comparative costs, like what is the, the, the cost of a diagnostic versus the treatment itself? I mean, if a diagnostic costs a dollar, but the treatment only costs, like most cases would be an antibiotic, which would be very cheap. Um, so. I, I think that, that that's a case that needs to be made, and you have to make it another, through another perspective. You have to make it through perhaps um, uh, like uh, capping antimicrobial resistance or something like that. But um, I, I think it's something to be aware of because when it comes down to the, practical, the practicalities of purchasing, are you going to be purchasing 100 diagnostics um, or 100 treat, um, anti uh, antibiotic treatment courses? Um, that's a decision that has to be made, and I think it's just a, a framing of that decision in a proper way uh, to, to really underscore the importance of diagnostics in these settings. So in, in the spirit of discussion, um, before we let you, you were definitely mentioned, Ellen, do you have any follow-up comments on that? If, if not, that's fine. Could we, sorry, I didn't prepare for that. So maybe we'll let you go first and then I'll, I'll come back to you. Okay, just uh, one comment uh, still to follow up. Uh, the first contact with, uh, of people with the medic medical establishment of any kind is actually usually the pharmacy in many places and not, not any kind of diagnostic. So it's some kind of over-the-counter drug or, or some other kind of drug distribution. So one way that we're thinking about addressing that is, is you know, if there's, you, you can sort of fight that or you could work with that. And if we could somehow empower pharmacists allow them to do diagnostics, enable them to do diagnostics in one form or another, that might actually get us a lot further than sort of trying to establish a parallel healthcare network that sort of starts with diagnostics first. That's interesting if I might chime in. There was actually a fantastic piece in The New Yorker recently about Cepheid and the role of healthcare uh, providers, if you will, in uh, India, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but sort of how there is established sort of market outside the hospital that actually is, uh, I'll use the word synergistic, but that may not be the appropriate uh, verb um, with the hospital setting. So that's a great point. Alan, did you want to follow up? If you're good, okay. Other comments, even so, from the- So just on, oh, the, on, the, yeah. on the, the point of care side again, I, I think that's absolutely true. You want to, that's the whole, I mean, 
the whole point of the kind of the projects that I work in and DREV is to look at what's there and, and utilize it and try not to change as, as little as possible because the minute you try to educate somebody or change their ways, you're immediately introducing potential um, uh, lack of success because people won't adopt what you want. I mean, another angle in India in particular is the, is the ASHA network. The, 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 the local women who get called in when babies are born and, and they're, they're kind of just the local medical expert. They don't have any medic, usually any medical expert. There's about 700,000 of them. So if you can find a way to give them diagnostic tools that are really simple, don't require telemedicine, don't require anything else, but can give them a yes, no answer to send somebody to the hospital, that's obviously really important. One of the, the, the products in the, in the um, in the jaundice diagnosis, a jaundice uh, suite that we're developing at DREV is a transcutaneous detection for bilirubin through the skin using simple LEDs. And the idea there is to literally have a yes, no, or a smiley face, or a, or a, or a frowning face answer on, on, a, on the device that says, take this person to the hospital or take this person to your nearest clinic. I think, I think that, uh, that the perspective of the, the pharmacy being the main point of contact or initial point of contact is, is true in the U.S. too. I mean, the, the proliferation of, you know, the uh, minute clinic kind of places um, that, you know, a lot of people do go for their, their first pass at, at medical care and being able to develop devices that are useful in that context will also be a, uh, have an impact. Great. I'll wait and hear from the front. I just wanted to make a comment to what Alan said. So obviously all these comments are totally relevant, but the fact that most of the time when we are thinking about global diseases, we are thinking of acute and infectious diseases, a lot of times. But uh, the clinical utility you mentioned and the fact if there is, if you cannot impact the outcome, even if you knew the diagnosis, for example, in the case of some of the cancers, what does it do, especially if it's very expensive? So I think it's a very fair statement. And one has to think longer term. Cancer, of course, is not even curable today for lot for most part, but one day it may become a chronic disease. Then how do you manage that, and how do these things play into this? Um, that was my comment on this. I do have a separate um, line of thought, so maybe sure. I'll give Does it anyone back. want to follow up on that comment first? Okay. I'd say in terms of cancer, that's probably the next big frontier for, for many, many diagnostic companies, as you say, is still a, a, a tremendous disease, and in very few instances, in very few cases, we have a survival rate that is um, acceptable, if you will, even though nothing is really acceptable if it's lo below 100%. But the, the role of diagnostic, and especially companion diagnostics in this segment, is making huge inroads. Right now, uh, even pharma companies are changing their medical their philosophy, where in the beginning was one, one size fits all in terms of drugs. Right now they're fully aware that the same drug does not work in the same, the same way in different, different patients. So characterizing the genetic, the genotype of the patient, uh, the way the drug is metabolized, the way the, the, the patient responds to any single treatment is, is extremely important to predict the outcome of the treatment itself. In patients that will respond to the drug, we have very targeted treatment, improved um, response ratio. In patients that do not respond to the drug, and we know that before giving the drug, we will save um, a lot of pain in, in, in customer from a physical and, and psychological pain, in, in not seeing if any progression in, uh, in, in their health. And also we avoid huge costs associated with, with side effects, which all drugs have. So again, diagnostics is, is probably too, too much underestimated, especially in chronic therapies like, like um, cancer. I had another comment for Peter. Um, I obviously, Cepheid has done a tremendous job in coming up with assays after assays, with pretty successful ones, although you said you're a nonprofit, but plenty of revenue. <laughs> uh, so the question I had on the TB, I haven't quite read the paper yet. You know, in the context of public health, it would be important to actually diagnose TB not at six months when the number of counts is, I don't know, 10,000 or something. Can this test, or are you developing future tests where you, it could be used for screening way before somebody becomes symptomatic for TB so that you could actually contain or prevent or manage TB much better in places like India or wherever else it happens? Right. And so this is, this is the kind of work that actually I think BioVentures does and find in what's the right test for intervening at the right place. The Cepheid test 
uh, the gene expert test is for patients who are symptomatic, who are, who are coughing, where you can get a sputum specimen and you detect uh, tuberculosis in the sputum. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of people that have latent disease, right? And that's a different test uh, that's involved there. A lot of uh, places, including FIND uh, funding work, uh, to replace uh, the PPD test, right, the skin test. That, that is what detects latent uh, TB. People are infected but might have disease. And, and uh, been a lot of work for a long time looking for a good serological uh, assay. Uh, hasn't been that successful. It's a big uh, issue, but a lot of uh, funding, I think, from uh, uh, the Gates Foundation, from the NIH in that area uh, for looking for uh, latent disease. But I think what you bring up is an important thing. You've got to look at uh, what's the need and pick the right tool for the job. But the, anyway, to answer your question, the cepheid assay is for symptomatic patients who have, who have disease mm -hmm. and producing bacteria. Eric, do you have any comments on that? I know you've mentioned that you're working on TB with the cell scope. Well, so we're, our, our approach is using microscopy, so it's, you know, it it's uh, falls into the, the smear positive regime of being able to find it. So it's not, you know, it, well, the, I mean, there's, there's, there's kind of the trade off of, uh, you know, molecular methods, um, you know, could find it at, at much lower levels, but would be more expensive to run, so you can't run that on everybody. Um, ours is less sensitive, but very inexpensive. Just to, just to add to that really quickly, I mean, and to underscore um, on Peter's point, uh, it's absolutely, I think, vital to understand that this is not a one-size-fits-all, it's not a silver bullet scenario. Um, you know, it was part of the studies, and actually some of the results that came out of our, um, our innovation map uh, report, would show that, you know, while point of care, even if it has a lower sensitivity, is actually at least the more treatment because you'd get, you'd be able to do it right there when the patient's on, on site. But even in some other scenarios, though, it might actually even be cheaper just to, um, uh, you know, equip uh, cars and transport vehicles to, to take the specimens uh, to a, a central diagnostics lab and, um, and then get the, the, the results that way. So it really depends on like, the infrastructure, it depends on um, the disease, it depends on uh, the, the, if you're in a completely rural setting or if you're in um, a slightly heavily um, a better populated area. And so I, I think this is a, it, it's really um, situation specific. And uh, it's one thing that we do do quite a bit is looking to um, impact assessment for um, particular diagnostics in different scenarios in, in uh, rural settings in Africa versus um, larger metropolit um, metropolitans in uh, like Southeast Asia, for example. These, these are quite different. Mm -hmm. One of the first things we did in working with FIND uh, was come up with, uh, based on their study of the needs, come up with a def uh, real detailed product requirements document that then we work off of, and that's very important. And uh, I mean, I think if you're interested in this area, one place to look at is, uh, is the FIND website, find.org, and their plan for tuberculosis. And, uh, and, and they talk about the different levels of care, the reference uh, level, the district, the sub-district, and the community level, and with different objectives in terms of diagnostic tests um, uh, at each of those levels and over time. And I think uh, you're right, that's, there's in-between steps and there's different needs at the different levels. Kelly? Hi, Kelly Carnes at UC Berkeley. Um, I have a question for Andy and Eric. Um, We've heard a lot about cell phone technology and using, having this kind of becoming a goal, uh, golden opportunity. Um, and I'm just wondering, in your experience, both um, on the industry side, trying to kind of ally with them, and then also, Andy, your work, trying to bring them in and motivate them to become involved, what, what are the challenges that still remain and kind of limitations to getting this technology um, to bring together? I think for us, one of the challenges has, has been, um, you know, if we, if we want to use a, an individual handset, if we want to let people in, in, in the field use their own phone as part of the device, you know, there's, there's so many different types of phones and uh, being able to, to standardize development is you know, good, very difficult um, when, when we're working with the whole range of, of possible you know, technology that we have to work with. Um, I think that you know, the, the, there are some opportunities for, for, for the handset manufacturers um, to possibly differentiate themselves, you know, to, to produce products that include, uh, you know, additional, um, you know, a, a sensor without a lens or some things that, that might make them uh, more readily, more readily uh, usable in, in this sort of context. But so, so far, I think one of the challenges, probably the main challenge of using, using handsets, general handsets, is just that there are so many types. Um, 
Yeah, I'd actually underscore that too. I mean, I think that uh, another side is not there's just so many types, but the technology is advancing so quickly that um, it's hard to to get you know uh, something which is going to be usable as, as new cell phones come out. I think um, a few diagnostics companies that we've spoken to have actually thought that it's, it's cheaper than instead of doing a, a cell phone or trying to retrofit a cell phone to actually develop a whole new device as well that's just going to you know, be there for the next few generations of technology. Um, and then, and then uh, of course, there, there's always the infrastructure issues as well. Um, uh, but yeah, I think that's probably the one that we've seen most. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I think one of the one of the lessons that, that we've learned along the way in, in developing this technology is that in a lot of these applications, the asset is not really the handset, it's the network, and that you know, this, this network is pervasive in a lot of places, and you know, we can't really chase handsets, but the network's going to be there, and so we can you know, use a variety of devices that allow us to increase access into you know, very remote places that, that do have uh, network penetration. So I guess using the moderator's prerogative, I would ask a question of you, and it's, um, have you essentially gotten a lot of pushback from the cell phone makers in terms of getting access to their hardware, software, whatever it is? I mean, is it, it sounds like a great solution, and obviously there's alternate solutions that also sound fantastic, but are there hurdles in working with the companies in that way? Yeah, we, we have. When, uh, you know, so, so far when we've, as we've approached a, a couple of different handset manufacturers, they, they've been unwilling to share the secrets of their, uh, you know, their, their um, you know, sensor specs and their optical specs in, in their phones. And so we've kind of had to reverse engineer around that a little bit. Um, but yeah, it'd be, if, if anybody out there uh, is, is from one of those companies that wants to work with us, that'd be great. WikiLeaks. Yeah, okay. Great. I know there's a couple more questions in the back. I do want to make sure. Hi, Shail Kumar with UC Berkeley. Uh, most of the morning, a low resource setting was discussed in the context of developing countries. Eric, you introduced low resource setting even in the US. Could the, you and the panel talk a little bit about how that is defined the low resource setting? Well, I was, I was referring to it. I mean, the, so, you know, there's a lot of different resources that, that are you know, discussed. Um, but the, 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 the scarce resource in the US is, is probably time, I guess. You know, people, uh, there, there are plenty of doctors, but getting to one, especially if you're in uh, the remote part of the US, is, is difficult. And so, you know, what our, our thought of that is to try and, you know, give access to doctors from home. Um, saving people time and saving them a trip. But, you know, we don't, we, you know, the, in the U.S. we have the luxury of not having to worry about the intermittent power and refrigeration and all that stuff for the assays. So, you know, the different resources are available here and, you know, less available other places. So, so just to, um, two patterns that are interesting in terms of translating technology that's developed for the developing world back into the developed world. One is that there's quite a lot of activity from developed world manufacturers and suppliers looking at what's being developed in the developing world and, use, and looking to license it and bring it into the, developing, into the developed world. Um, uh, I guess because of the focus on cost reduction and perhaps removing extraneous uh, functions that aren't needed and taking out the blue LEDs that everybody thinks are really sexy but don't really do anything. Those kind of, fun those kind of um, design criteria, those kind of needs uh, can translate well then back into the developed world. The other trend is that a product that is developed as either a medical device or a, or a, or a diagnostic device in the developing world for use by a clinician can end up being a home-based device in the developed world where perhaps there's more support or more knowledge or, or background. And so that's another trend that's happening. Uh, companies are trawling the developing world technologies to see what can be used as a home-based device in the developed world. Columbia. Uh, so, so actually my question is for uh, Pete uh, Safiad, but Eric, uh, just responding to what you were saying before, I, I was wondering also if, if you had talked to Qualcomm, because they're actually relatively uh, involved in bringing their devices to the developing world. But uh, maybe I'll ask Pete uh, a question as well. So con congratulations on all your success so far. It's really uh, fantastic. Just a couple of questions, because there are a lot of theoretical models on how to move these sorts of devices into the market, but you guys are actually on the verge of doing it. So number one, uh, can you comment on the distribution uh, strategy in terms of what levels of the infrastructure you would want to distribute your product to initially? And also number two, the financial model, uh, building on actually just the previous comment here, 
do you see this as really a massively profitable business, a moderately profitable business in the developing world? Uh, and if not, then do you have a strategy of going into the US or Europe market? Because there is a very large MDR, XDR market here as well. Okay, good question. Uh, actually, the gene expert uh, tuberculosis assay was uh, released and has been sold in Europe as a CEIVD product. So CEIVD is the regulatory uh, structure and evaluation that is done uh, in Europe uh, for, since a year ago. And so that, so uh, Cepheid was motivated in that terms of, uh, of funding uh, in that we've developed the same product both for the developed world and developing countries. And in that, in fact, that's, that's Fine's uh, point of view, in fact, is that uh, the developing countries deserve the same quality of diagnostics as the developed world. So it is actually no different. Uh, we're, it's a little bit more difficult to go in the United States with the FDA the regulatory requirements. We are actually going to head in that direction. And uh, we've actually uh, spoken with the FDA, and we will be taking this on for uh, an FDA uh, 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 cleared product also. We're also going to, all we're working with uh, FIND on an HIV assay, a uh, viral load assay, and again, the same thing. It's going to have the same product requirement documents or requirements as, um, as uh, would be true of the developing countries. But uh, the, uh, basically the, um, uh, the, the, the sales of the assay and the instruments to developing countries, high burden, uh, countries is basically at cost, slightly above cost, and that's actually this on the both the WHO and the fine site is a complete uh, discussion of all the costs. Uh, the value to Cepheid then is they have an assay that we can then sell in uh, in the developed world. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just a quick follow. Mm -hmm. Do you see that you would uh, wait to have a successful rollout strategy, say in Europe first, in order to subsidize your rollout in Africa? Or would you uh, be willing to sell things yeah. at cost in Africa first, right. Right. and maybe at some point down the line go back to Europe? They're actually being uh, sold and distributed in Africa over the last past year. Because even in developing countries, uh, there, uh, there are laboratories and physicians, and, and in particular regions, where people uh, can pay for the assay. Um, and so, actually, there's been uh, thousands and thousands of tests already run in Africa and India and South Africa. The, the process that we've gone through is, is one uh, d uh, that's defined by the WHO. And it's uh, to have an initial trial, that, uh, that clinical trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and then the WHO uh, requires demonstration trials. That's the 7,000 to 9,000 uh, in very different uh, uh, countries under very different situations with different levels of, uh, of uh, laboratories. Uh, and then, then there's an evaluation by their STAG group, uh, their strategic and technical advisory group, uh, to make a decision whether they recommend it or not. And now the funding starts with PEPFAR, Unitaid, and, uh, and various organizations. So actually, the, the assay's been out there for over a year. Um, this is uh, less of a question, more of an advertisement, but um, my name is Isaac Penny. I'm a PhD student at Stanford, and um, I study uh, active TB screening with community health workers, which are these uh, large, often large networks of uh, volunteer uh, Ministry of Health representatives that are elected at the village level, um, similar to the ASHA system that Stuart Colson mentioned. And um, at lunch, if anyone is interested in talking about um, how to motivate that particular type of health worker, how to monitor them for quality. Um, those are things I spend my, my day thinking about and um, proposing studies to try and test. So um, if you want to find me at lunch, feel free and we can continue the discussion. Who has the other microphone? Could you, are you, do you have a question or do you want to get to Bernard, would you have a Uh, it's, it's not a comment on this, but it's a question. So uh, 
uh, there was a lot of talk about cost, right? And uh, whatever technology, it has to be extremely inexpensive. And uh, so we have, uh, nevertheless, we have heard a whole range, right, from the DX box, which, 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 which uh, was too expensive, all the way to that, that's uh, all the way to paper. And uh, uh, very often uh, people take stances, right? Uh, uh, paper or something less than, a, uh, less than a dollar is the only way to go uh, and others may say, well, no, uh, we need to have a technology that actually uh, gets a sensitivity that uh, addresses the need, like Cepheid certainly doesn't make its machines out of paper. Uh, so can you come, so, so probably the answer is not black and white. Probably in some cases, uh, uh, the uh, less than a dollar test may be the only, and also the right answer, maybe there is actually a less than a dollar test, and in others it's clearly not the right answer. Also it's not perhaps that uh, uh, more expensive equipment, like you mentioned, that uh, your machines that are actually being used in Africa uh, certainly can be used. Can you maybe comment on where, uh, what technology makes most sense? We could, uh, Paul, if you have a comment on that, so Bernard Bozer from UC Berkeley, since you were just specifically. Before I hand it over to, to Cepheid, you know, a couple of years ago, the Gates Foundation had their annual meeting and they had it in South Africa. And one of the things they did was they did learning visits. So they took us to a township and then they took us to the TB testing lab for the Western Cape. So this was one of two labs that did all the TB testing for all of South Africa. And you know, you would assume, oh, you know, this, this is a relatively rich country, but they have a lot of very poor people, huge rates of, of TB. Well, what you saw was a million dollars of midget machines, okay? This is, the instruments themselves were $150,000 each or something like that. So the answer is that an instrument does not have to be low cost. What has to be low cost is the cost per test, wherever you do it. That's the, kit, the critical issue. If you can give away or sell $100,000 instrument, you know, but you can still do a lot of tests with it, that's proven to be an acceptable strategy in the developing world as long as you can get the samples to the test. In that case, it was done by motorcycle. I sense an opportunity here for some vigorous discussion. Do the panelists have any comments? Um, I think uh, what Bernard said was, uh, is true. One size doesn't fit all. And that's really, and I can see why the Gates Foundation did that, is re you really need to understand uh, what's out there in the different levels. And a microscopy center is different from a reference laboratory, uh, is different from a, a district laboratory, and is different from more uh, community-based. And different things are going to be um, uh, uh, appropriate. Different uh, technologies are going to be appropriate. But what I say is, again, um, I think uh, I'm, I'm not sure that cheap is the objective. Uh, that ridiculously cheap is the objective always. The objective is to change and improve health care. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I think we can get there and it may not be cheap initially. Uh, and we also have to think that things change over time. Uh, right now, the, the Cepheid assay uh, detect, uh, interrogates six different targets on the, uh, the genome of tuberculosis so that it can uh, detect multiple drug resistance. And we're working on an XDR, uh, extreme drug resistant assay, and faster assays, and assays, and instruments that don't need uh, to work on, uh, you know, 220 volt uh, AC. So that's why you have to get started. You have to have get something out there, and uh, and then improve on it. Yeah, just to add a very kind of a general point too is that, but um, in the work that we're doing in in terms of uh, uh, trying to understand, um, you know, what would the technical specifications of an ideal diagnostic look like. Um, when you actually try to get a pinpoint on price points, it's actually very difficult to do. Um, and we've, heard, we've seen this from a number of other foundations, XPRIZE Foundation, for example, they're doing their TB point of care diagnostic competition. Um, they don't have a price point, really. Um, the reason is, is that, uh, or the way they, they explained it, is that by putting a price point down, it would limit um, developers to uh, trying to hit a certain type of technology or using a certain type of technology. Whereas in, the, in a, a different scenario, when there was no price point, they may have a more expensive technology. But it's something that a sponsor or a country would still be willing to purchase and would still be willing to actually um, uh, use within their healthcare systems. So when you ask them now in the present sense, like how much would you pay for something in the future, they'll give you a low cost. But if you actually put it on, on, on a table in front of them and say, we can give you, uh, you know, 100,000 of these for a higher price, they may still be willing to open up their wallets for that. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to get accurate um, uh, price assessments 
um, uh, looking forward um, to, to actually help guide what, what technologies, uh, this is what we found anyways. So I guess the, the, the quick answer is there is no right price or, or threshold price, but price is one of the things in the mix in terms of figuring out whether your product and solution is going to be impactful. And so if you take a, if you take a decision that you're going to design your product and the design decisions result in it costing $100,000, that immediately impacts what your market is and how many people you're going to treat and what you're going to do. So you need to look at the entire holistic view of where your product's going to be used, who's going to use it, who you're going to try and impact. I, I would say a couple of other quick things. Um, there's, um, particularly when you're in the product development arena or when you're, when you're doing research, there's um, often um, a tendency to think about cost. And the real problem is not cost, it's price. Uh, cost of a physical device uh, for the developing world, as a rule of thumb, is about 20% of the actual price to get it into the hands of the final user. And so there's 80% of the cost that involves shipping and distribution and taxation and all these other things that you can be as novel about in your design as the actual physical device. But if you think about them all together, the decisions that you make in the area of the 80% of the business, if you like, can impact your design decisions on the actual product. You can decide to change raw material because the raw material has a 0% tariff instead of a 300% tariff. And you need to think about all those things together in order to decide how impactful you're going to be. And if I made another comment on, on technology as well, I guess the consensus is there's no um, one size fits all. But let me give you an example of MRSA, for example. MRSA, you can have two ways to detect MRSA, the medicine, uh, streptococcus resistant uh, antibiotic. Uh, one way is a chromagger. Uh, chromagger is, is a plate, it costs 50 cents, you have results in three days. It's perfectly fine, no problem, when time is not of, of, an, of an issue. In an ICU, when you suspect MRSA infection, you can't rely on chromagger. You have to go deep. You have to go for something that is genetic, that is fast, that is immediate, 30, 60 minutes, 90 minutes tops, and that has a much higher cost. So to build on what Stuart just said and just put in reverse, price is not that relevant as the cost per result. How much does it cost? You can have a very cheap assay, but you have to do it twice because it has a 50% false positive. It ends up, you end up paying more than, than a cheaper assay. Um, and I would also change in terms of the, of the equation it's not the cost or the price of a device, it's the cost of non-quality, how much you're willing to pay for an error that will have tremendous disaster consequences down the road. That's, that's a good point, I'll just be real brief, is uh, in, in WHO in evaluating uh, the Cepheid Gene Expert assay, evaluated it in three main uh, environments. One is where multiple drug resistant is common, one where there's co-infection with HIV, and one, uh, uh, none of the above. And they came up with recommendations in terms of the use of the assay that are different depending on those environments. And those are based on both health income and cost assessment uh, uh, actions. And, and, uh, and if you want more details, again, look at the FIND or the WHO website. Okay, great. We're gonna go down here and then I know there's another microphone back there, but Bernard, please. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, my, my comment was on, it's, it's it's still important to not underestimate sort of the, I mean, the, the, the one size fits all. I mean, it's, if it doesn't fit all, it's, it's true, certainly. But it's, it's important not to underestimate the specific importance now of the Cepheid system as a trailblazer product, in a sense. Because it's really, it is the first kind of of its kind that is sort of, I think, is trying to make an attempt at uh, capturing a significant chunk of all diagnostic testing for that particular issue for TB. Uh, if you look at other kinds of devices, um, machines, you know, like CD4 testing or so on, even though they have gotten a lot of support from the Clinton Foundation and so on, they still only capture a relatively small chunk of overall uh, testing, a, a, a significant it, the, the vast majority on all t diagnostics at this point is still syndromic, meaning no diagnostic whatsoever. Step up from that, there's microscopes that captures a certain chunk bigger than any other thing. Then beyond that, uh, strip tests 
less than microscopes, but still more than anything else. And then as long as nothing, and then you have a few uh, machines. And I think the, the game changer here is, and what we all really want to know, is can a device like the Cepheid system capture a significant portion of the overall diagnostics market in, in low resource settings? And it's a trail place in a sense because there will be products that will be like the Cepheid system that will cost maybe you know, half, a quarter, a tenth, you know, over the next five years or so. So, so we, I think we will all follow it very closely. And I think it has to be able to test more than just TB, right? Is, and that's why we're working on HIV, HPV, sexually transmitted diseases. Yeah. Comment in the back, please. Hi, my name is Richard Lowe. I work for Venture Strategies Innovations, which is a nonprofit based in California that works in maternal health. Uh, this isn't a plug for what we do, it's a lead into the question. Um, we work to facilitate introduction of a drug called mesoprostol into developing countries. It's a drug that's used for postpartum hemorrhage prevention and treatment and a lot of other obstetric uses. Um, mesoprostol is a 35-year-old drug that was originally developed for gastric ulcers. It's no longer used for gastric ulcers, it's been superseded. But it's an old technology. So the question I have for all of the panelists is, in, in the sort of uh, search for new technologies, have we missed something that we already know that is a simple, easy way of doing something that is very applicable in a low resource setting? And one example I know of, the, the, the maternal health world has sort of, they've been on postpartum hemorrhage for a long time and post-abortion care, and they're moving on to preeclampsia and eclampsia, which is the next big uh, killer of women. And one of the tests for that is proteinuria, so measuring the amount of protein in the urine, that's a big sign. And you can use dipsticks, and you get a reasonably accurate, well, anything from about 20% to 90% sensitivity specificity. One thing they're actually going back to look at that's actually very accurate is boiling urine. If it goes cloudy, it's protein in the urine. Very, very simple and very easy to do. So the question for all the panelists, and, and I don't mean this just in the strip test or the actual diagnostic, maybe a tool that's used as part of that. Um, any comments on that? So I think it's absolutely right. Um, looking at what's gone before is one of the key questions that in extreme affordability we ask our students to look at. Um, one of the questions that they get very early on when they know what project they're working on, when they're trying to do competitive analysis, believe it or not, we do competitive analysis for the developing world, is um, what did they do 100 years ago in the developed world? And many products have come out of that. We had a, a famous example a couple of years ago of a corn sheller for Ethiopia which was actually discovered because the students went onto eBay and searched for corn shellers and found an antique American corn sheller, which they then could make out of um, mild steel and distribute in Ethiopia. So exactly the same thing is true in, in medical devices and, and diagnostic devices. It doesn't need to be all bells and whistles. It should, I, in my opinion, it shouldn't be technology driven. It should be um, solution driven. Great. So if I might make one comment or a question to you, Stuart, as well, is we've had this interest in identifying the unmet needs and sort of focusing in on them, benchmarking them, going through the technology concept generation and down selection process. What can you comment on or what can you say regarding sustainable translation of the technologies into the, the low resource settings? Are there any, you know, uh, I guess, key points you would make in terms of successful and sustained translation of technologies? So, so, so sustainability for me is, is all about making sure everybody has the same incentive or at least you've incentivized everybody along the chain in the way that they need to be incentivized. Um, again, one of the first questions we ask is um, who is going to value this product enough to buy it? And if that turns out that the answer is the end user or the answer is a medical supplier or the answer is um, an NGO or a foundation, that will dictate what you do and how, how your business operates. But the best way for sustainability is to look at the product being competitive and for people along the chain from the manufacturer to the end user actually making money doing it. And, and that's the ultimate uh, sustainable solution. If people start to compete and improve based on competitive requirements, that's what's going to provide sustainability. So again, in, in DREV's model, at the moment we're um, a non-profit Real nonprofit, real, a real, real intentionally nonprofit. <laughs> um, we're, we're yes, we're in, we're a nonprofit um, designing the products. We take the product 
straight right through to design for manufacture and then we find uh, partners usually in country but not necessarily who take our blueprints and make the product as a commercial product and so they we design the product so that they can make money uh, making it and selling it and distributing it and we we analyze the entire chain for them we give them a package that says if you manufacture it this way if you do, if you do, do, um, distribute it using this network if you uh, access credit or whatever in this format you will make a profit and that's that gives them the incentive to do it ultimately the licensing fees from what we do because that's also part of the competitive process should make DREV self-sustaining and we can uh, fund new products from old licenses Great. So I think it's almost time for lunch. Um, so with that, I wanted to make a, first of all, join me, please, in thanking the panel uh, for their comments. <laughs> and also I'd like to thank all of the people who asked questions or made comments and the student moderators as well. Before we break, there are a couple of things I want to note. First of all, lunch is right outside here, uh, so there's no need to go out into the rain today. Um, you will know from your check-in that you have been assigned a table number, and some of our students worked very hard to mix it up, if you will, and get different uh, perspectives at the table. So by all means, please engage in conversation, but if you could sit at that table at least for a little while, that would be fantastic. On that note, we uh, don't want to waste any time um, during our short time together, so we have um, the SEND staff have worked to develop what we're calling a design challenge. Um, so basically on your table, you're going to find some information and some small index cards that's going to pose some questions to you. So hopefully that'll be a stimulant for some further discussion, um, but potentially also some interesting uh, solutions could come out of that. Um, and we'll start again here at 2.30. Is that? Yeah, according to my schedule, it's 2.30. So right after lunch in this room. Thank you all very much. <laughs>